Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 to 34. These are the family records of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took as his wife, Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord was receptive to his prayer and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. But the children inside her struggled with each other and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. When her time came to give birth, there were indeed twins in a womb. The first one came out red-looking, covered with hair like a fur coat, and they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. When the boys grew up, Esau became an expert hunter and outdoorsman, but Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field exhausted. He said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff because I'm exhausted. That's why he was also named Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, said Esau, I'm about to die. So what good is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to Jacob and sold his birthright to him. Then Jacob gave bread and lentil stew to Esau. He ate, drank, got up, went away. So Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray and uh, then we can spend some time looking at God's word together. Uh, Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Your word is a light to our hearts, minds, and hands. Your word is the revelation of your nature. And so, Father, gathered together today as people in all different generations from all different backgrounds, please apply your word to our hearts so that we know you more deeply and serve your Son more wholeheartedly. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're on page 20, like I said, Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 to 34. There's an outline uh, in your service sheets, and up on the other side at the top is a household chat column or area, and uh, there's some questions for you to use later on uh, in your household, no matter how big or small, just to think about some of the stuff we've learnt this morning. These are the family records of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. It's a familiar heading if you've been listening through the Genesis series, isn't it? Uh, We had it last week up there in verse 12, and it occurs 10 times in the book of Genesis. Each time you see that heading, you're being told we're up to the next generation of God dealing with this broken world, the the next line of the family tree. Uh, If you like technical language and you like to show off that you know Hebrew and I don't, uh, it's called a toldot formula, a toldot formula. But I hope as I was reading that, you notice that this one was different. This is different to the other nine. Uh, Did you see there the repetition about Abraham? Did you see there that we're told that Abraham fathered Isaac? No other Toldot formula looks over its shoulder. Every Toldot formula looks forwards and tells you about the next generation, but not this one. Now, this one wants you to take a backwards glance, doesn't it? It wants you to look back at everything that has already happened before. It wants to remind you that God himself, the one we sin against, the one we thumb our noses at, God himself has done something in the world. Uh, This told up wants to remind us that God's intervention in the world is based on him, his character, his choice, his commitment not in anything to do with us. 
Uh, this one wants to remind us that God has made a choice of a man called Abraham. Remember Abraham? He was the idol-worshipping geriatric with no kids and no interest in God. And God tapped him on the shoulder and said, Hey, Abraham, through your family, I'm going to roll back sin and bring blessing. I'm going to make a promise to you of a land and a people, and through you I'm going to change this broken world. This told dot formula is meant to warm our hearts and minds when we remember that God did exactly as he promised. Remember last week's sermon? Remember that we saw that Abraham died and he was buried by his son, his family. He was buried in a little foretaste, a burial plot taste of the land that God promised. And remember he sent away his other boys who fathered nations and he sent them away with material gifts. He was already blessing the world through his own family, wasn't he? God did everything that he promised. This little toll dot formula gives us a big picture of God's plans for this broken world. And at the heart of it is grace. Grace drenches every branch of this family tree. Grace drenches every branch of this family tree. From the decision of God to go into the Garden of Eden to find Adam and Eve, to clothe them, to send them out, to continue to have mercy on the world, to choose Abraham, to bring a son from Abraham's dead body with Sarah, to bring a boy who caused laughter. And so when we read this told out and it says, take a backward glance, Abraham fathered Isaac. It wants to drive home that you are meant to be looking for grace. It's a prelude for the next section that comes out. And everywhere you look, every part of this family tree, you will see grace. Now, it's all very well for me to talk about grace, but what am I talking about? Well, if you look there on your outline, there should be a definition of grace. Grace is the display of God's character and choice-driven commitment to this broken world. His undeserved kindness to those who deserve his judgment. That's a wordy definition, isn't it? Kind of like the preacher at the moment. But it's a definition that we want to see fits with this prelude. So everywhere we look, we're going to stop and say, is, is there grace here like we've just defined? Well, look there at verse 20. I'm at the next point on the Alan. Isaac was 40 years old when he took as his wife Rebecca, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Well, grace doesn't stop because who brought these two together? Remember that marvellous story about that unnamed household manager who was faithful and did his job, and lo and behold, Isaac meet Rebecca, Rebecca meet Isaac. We're also given a picture here of where Isaac sits in relationship with his wider family. That'll be helpful in a couple of chapters. We're also told his age, he's 40. And then we're told that he faces a terrible predicament. Verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, childless. Don't underestimate that on a personal level. The sadness, even the shame in that culture. And don't underestimate it as a hurdle in the wider scheme of God's plans. Oh, We were told a little earlier in 25 verse 11 that God blessed Isaac. We were told that Rebecca was sent to her marriage with a blessing of children in 24 verse 60. We were told God's promise that through Isaac, God would bring nations and blessings to the world, chapters 22 and 21. So there's a problem here, isn't there? Blessed and no kids. Nations and no kids. Isaac's response is just as clear as the predicament. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. Here's a man faced by a significant issue in everyday life. What does he do? Here is a man who faces an issue and the world says, look at all your options for solving it. I mean, just look at how your father handled it. And what does he do? Isaac brings his problem to the Lord in prayer. Isaac brings his problem to the Lord in prayer. And it's not a one-off kind of shoot a hopeful arrow up into heaven kind of prayer, is it? Because when you get a little later, you find out that this man prayed for 20 years. The conception came when he was 60. 60. 
This is a man who brought his whole life to the Lord in prayer for two decades. He brought his whole life in dependence under the Lord. He was a man who faced this problem and looked at the world from whose perspective? From the worldview of God, from God's supervision, from God's grace. Now, don't put Isaac on a pedestal yet. That would be foolish. He's just like us, isn't he? He likes red meat. He struggles with parenting. He wilts under pressure. He doesn't like a broken world. But when this man faces this problem, what does he do? He submits his whole life to the Lord. That's a marvellous image. But can I say that in the week preparing this sermon, it was slightly confronting for me to see a man deal with his problems this way. And the Lord heard, didn't he? The Lord answered. The Lord heard his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. The Lord enabled this child. Abraham fathered Isaac. The grace of God on every branch of this family tree. But now Rebecca faces a predicament. Did you notice that? The predicament's everywhere in this passage. Verse 22, but the children inside her struggled with each other and she said, why is this happening to me? Literally, they smash their heads together in the womb. Literally, she cries out, why am I still alive? And what does she do? Well, she too brings her problems before the Lord, doesn't she? She too submits her life to the perspective of God. She too brings her inquiry before the Lord. It's a marvellous image, isn't it? A marvellous image of a husband and wife in prayer before the Lord who bring their problems before God because they know the track record of God's grace. Their marriage is a testimony to it, isn't it? And we as the readers are reminded of the truth of Abraham fathered Isaac. Everywhere you look, God's grace drenches this tree. His merciful kindness because of his character and his decision, his commitment to this broken world. And again, we're reminded of that as God answers her inquiry. Look there in verse 23. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Two nations from these two children. The nations will continue the conflict they began in the womb, in the outside world. They will be separated and the younger will have the supremacy. It's a surprising answer in the context of the way the world works, isn't it? But isn't that the way God's grace works, if you think about it? His intervention brought the children about. His intervention is driving this family tree for the sake of the world. His intervention will suit his plans and fly in the face of society and cultural norms. The promise moved from Abraham to the son brought from the dead bodies and now it moves to the younger instead of the older. God's grace is the expression of God's choice. God's grace is the expression of God's choice. And we're reminded in Romans chapter 9, one of those readings that Phil brought us, that this wasn't based on anything deserving of these two fetuses. Romans chapter 9, and not only that, but also when Rebekah became pregnant by Isaac, our forefather, for though they'd not been born yet or done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to election might stand, not from works but from the one who calls... Rebecca was told, the younger will serve the older. It's driven by God, isn't it? Not by whether one was hairier or smoother than the other, one was stronger or weaker than the other, one was gooder or eviler than the other. It was driven by God's decision. His free gift, not earned, not deserved, not bought, but granted freely at God's decision. And indeed, two children were born. When her time came to give birth, there were indeed twins in her womb. 
The first one came out reddish, covered with hair, like a fur coat. Imagine that description. And they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out, grasping Esau's heel with his hand. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. They're different boys, aren't they? You could tell them apart, these two twins. They emerge in a clear order and their names match their distinctive birth features. And again, we're reminded of Isaac's diligence in prayer, aren't we? 20 years. Now, before we go any further, let me, let me just remind you of that definition of grace. It's there on your outline. Grace is the display of God's character and choice-driven commitment to this broken world. His undeserved kindness to those who deserve his judgment. Well, it's been borne out already, hasn't it, that definition? God's choice and commitment emerging from his very nature has driven his intervention in this world. It could only happen that way. It's only that choice that overcomes barrenness. It's only that decision that chooses the younger over the older. It's only the one offended by sin who can choose to step in and forgive sin and deal with a broken world. It's seen in his merciful provision to Isaac and Rebekah and to that younger son in words. God's gift, not earned, not deserved, not bought. And it's seen and responded to in everyday life, isn't it? That, that's why Isaac and Rebekah live with God's grace enveloping their lives because they know his track record. And the boys grow up. I'm at the next point on the outline, verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau became an expert hunter, an outdoorsman. But Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, they grow up. Esau, well, he's your hunter and your outdoors man. He's rugged, impulsive, impetuous, but hold your horses. Because nowhere in the Bible is the reference to being a hunter a positive reference. It's always negative. Always negative. On the other hand, Jacob, well, he's a quiet man, self-contained. Don't let that fool you. He's not a mummy's boy. He's not a wuss, this man. It means that he is self-reliant. He has a plan. Unlike his brother who is driven by his impulses and his rash desires, that's not the case with Jacob. He's on a mission. And then we're given another important point, aren't we? We're told about their relationships with their parents. Isaac favours Esau, Rebekah favours Jacob. There should be some alarm bells there, shouldn't there? And not just because of favouritism. Remember verse 23? Here are the seeds of the family conflict. We know that there'll be separation. God's already said that. We know that the younger, Jacob, will end up ruling the elder, Esau. But look at who the parents favour. Look at who the parents favour and the nature of the conflict is hinted at. But let's get back to these boys growing up and the next picture we have, verse 29, is I think a, a trip of a driving trip. I look there in verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field exhausted. And Jacob would never have cooked. That's the slave's job. The slaves cook. So the only explanation that people suggest is that mum and dad are back at the main camp and the boys are out driving, moving the stock. It sets the scene a little better, doesn't it? Kind of gives you the backdrop for this incident. Helps you understand why the drama unfolds this way. It's against the backdrop of the parents' favouritism, but it's also against the backdrop of their two natures. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff because I'm exhausted. That's why it was also named Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. <laughs> Look, said Esau, I'm about to die. So what good is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to Jacob and sold his birthright to him. And Jacob gave bread and lentil stew to Esau. He ate, drank, got up, went away. So Esau despised his birthright. Esau returns. He's impulsive, he's immediate, his desire is clear. He's starving. He can't even bring himself to say the word stew. That's how hungry he is. Just give me some of that red stuff. He's driven by his base desires. Jacob, he's waited for this moment, hasn't he? He's got a plan. 
Mum and dad are back there at the main camp. They're out on their own in the paddocks. He senses an opportunity, this self-contained man. First, sell me your birthright. He knows what a birthright is. He knows that if there are two boys, the elder gets everything. He knows if there are more than two, the elder boy gets a double portion and the rest fight over what's left. It's not a laughing matter, this birthright. And let me be very, very clear. A birthright is grace. Esau didn't deserve it. He just got born and he didn't even have a say in the matter. A birthright is grace. And Esau's response, remember that campfire where you sit around and you share the story of your history? Esau's response would have drawn a gasp, shock. How could you do such a thing? How could you let your hunger, your desire, your human nature override grace? How could you choose a stew over inheriting the whole family farm? Jacob makes sure that the deal's settled. He's no fool. Swear. Esau swears because his tummy is rumbling. Jacob serves it up. Think about this carefully. Jacob gets the birthright for a pile of lentils and a baguette. He gets everything for a pile of lentils and a chunk of bread. And the assessment of God's word is very clear. Look at verse 34. So Esau despised his birthright. It is very rare to get a line like that in the Old Testament. A line where the story is interrupted so you get a moral assessment of a character. And it's a damning assessment, isn't it? Esau has led his desire for lentils, turn him away from grace. And he is held responsible for that, isn't he? Time and time again in God's word. He knew the grace, he knew it was his, and he chose to turn his back on it because the stew was more desirable. And again, we've got to pause and think about our definition of grace, don't we? Grace is the display of God's character and choice-driven commitment to a broken world. His undeserved kindness to those who deserve his judgment. Well, God's grace reigns supreme throughout this whole episode. His grace comes to fruition, his decision. It does so against the backdrop of human nature and the human despising of grace. Neither Jacob or Esau emerge well out of this, do they? Jacob, well, he's a conniving, cunning planner. Esau, he's just driven by what his guts are saying. But I also want you to notice this. I want you to notice this very important reality. God's grace is not controlling, even though it is in control. God's grace does not exclude or excuse human culpability. So Esau is held up continually in God's word, isn't he? In God's word as a man who despised God's grace for a pile of lentils. It's an introduction, isn't it? I'm at point four on the outline. It's an introduction to the next phase. I mean, if it was a movie short, I'd be there. Everywhere you look, it's drenched with grace. Just think about the last 15 verses we've looked at and how much grace we've seen. God's character and choice-driven commitment to a broken world, to give it what it does not deserve. That definition has matched the events and the assessment of God's word is that we would be foolish, immoral, irreverent, to treat that grace lightly. And we've got a, got a case model, Esau, haven't we? And God's assessment, verse 34, God's grace is not to be despised, ignored, traded or diluted. Now the application could be pretty simple at this point, couldn't it? We just have a simple morality play, don't be like Esau. But I think there's more going on here than that. Now, we'll come back to that idea in a moment, but with a lot more depth. You see, it's worth pondering the contrast between Esau and the grace he rejected. I think we're actually meant to identify with Esau in this account because let me be honest with you, I am so like Esau. 
My base human desires run my life. That's the battle I face in me every day. We need money. We need this. We need satisfaction. We need that. We need fulfilment. We need reputation. We need this and we need that. And they rule our lives, don't they? Those base human desires. And they take us outside the framework of God's grace, the framework that Esau saw his parents operate in. Esau was ruled by his human nature, his human desires. Does he sound a little familiar? I'm so thankful that there was one man who wasn't. I'm so thankful that there was a man unlike Esau who did not despise the grace of his family tree. I'm so thankful that there was a man, unlike Esau, who expressed his family likeness the way it should have been. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, Philippians 2, who existing in the very form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man, And when he'd come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Jesus expressed his family likeness the way it should have been expressed, in humility and service. He did not say, I can use my godness for my own advantage, but he expressed his godness for the advantage of rebels. And unlike his ancestral relative Esau, he didn't despise his family, and so he did receive his birthright. For this reason, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a contrast to Esau. And I get the benefit. Jesus was not run by his base human desires. And so we benefit. Our judgment is paid. Our sins are forgiven. And we are drenched by the same grace that's on every branch of that family tree. But if we have benefited from that, if we have received God's grace through Jesus, if we call God our Father, listen to that warning that Phil read earlier. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and by it defiling many. And see that there is no immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for one meal. For you know that later when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Did you hear that warning? Esau despised grace that was to be his. He treated it flippantly and weakly. He treated it irreverently and cheaply. He treated it poorly and immorally. He did not understand it, so he did not hold on to it. That's a very serious warning, isn't it? Do we despise the grace from the son who did not despise his birthright. And if we do, what does that say? You see, if we do treat it lightly, if we do treat it cheaply, if we do treat it irreverently, perhaps that means we haven't understood it. Perhaps like Esau, our human passions take us away from grace. For the taste of a stew for the security of a dwelling, for the reputation of a valued job, for the comfort of a relationship, the grace of God is turned away from and it will end in tears like it did for Esau. 
But if we do treat it seriously, what does that look like? Well, let me finish with this. Therefore, since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God. Lay aside, run, focus. To treat God's grace in Jesus as seriously as it deserves is to deal with our sin. It means to recognise who is God and who is not. God is God and I am not. To treat God's grace in Jesus seriously is to pursue all of life in the framework of dependence on God without thought of cost or culture. It's to live like Isaac and Rebecca did for those 20 years. God is in charge, and so all things are his. All hopes, all dreams, all passions, all desires, they are all his. Now, I want to say that those actions can only be solid and constant if we actually spend time with that grace. Let me be even more simple. We cannot despise the grace that we know. Let me be even more simple. We cannot despise the grace we enjoy when we read it and pray it and teach it daily, just like Isaac and Rebecca did. Let me be even more simple. What are we deciding to do to spend time in the grace that God has shown us in Jesus Christ. Daily, constantly, continually, individually, communally. Let me pray. Father, the only reason we are here today is because you committed to a world that was so rebellious. The only reason that we are here today is because your son Jesus did not despise his birthright but expressed it in undeserved kindness to us. The only reason we are here today is because you have shown us grace. Father, thank you for that. Thank you that that is the foundation for who we are. Father, help us to know that grace deeply seriously and joyfully. Help it to transform our passions and desires. In Jesus' name, amen.